the Assistant Democratic Leader. Mr. President, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Senator Flake from Arizona, Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota, for bringing this timely issue to the floor. We are facing an attack on an American institution, an attack on our freedom of the press. Sadly, the President is making some award of some kind to uh, what he considers to be corrupt media. And I'm afraid, once again, that his actions will cast a shadow over our constitutional commitment to the basic freedoms we enjoy in America. We all know why freedom of press was included in the Bill of Rights, because the Founding Fathers, those who crafted those critical words that have led us for more than two centuries, believed that there should be accountability. Accountability when it came to the government, its actions, and to public officials. That accountability sometimes is painful, as Senator Flake has acknowledged. Uh, many of us, as members of the uh, Senate, House, and other political roles, uh, really hated to receive certain phone calls and questions from members of the press. But it is part of our responsibility as public servants, as public officials, to be accountable to the public. That is what freedom of the press is about. I think that's the part that troubles and worries and pains the President the most, that he will be held accountable for the things that he has said and the things that he has done. This notion of fake news, unfortunately, is a phrase which is being used, as Senator Flake noted, by despots and authoritarians around the world to try to silence its critics and to silence the press in their countries. We cannot allow this regimen of fake news and alternative facts and words like those to diminish our commitment to the basic constitutional protection of freedom of the press. It is essential to the future of our democracy. On January the 11th, that would be last Thursday, I was invited to a meeting at the White House to discuss the issue of immigration. Sadly, at that meeting, there were things said by the President and those who were with him on the issue, which I believe constituted an attack on another basic element of American history, a history of immigration. Mr. President, we are a nation of immigrants. That diversity, that has come to these shores from all across the world is a diversity which makes us strong. We consider our land of origin, whatever it may be, but we love the land we live in. And that was what immigration has meant to us and to previous generations for so many years. Words spoken by the President at that meeting were stunning and in some respects disgusting. To think that the President would make the comments he did for the sake of our congressional record for the Senate and for those who are watching, I will not repeat the President's words. They have been reported in the press. But I want to go to the heart of his criticism. He was raising a basic question as to whether the United States should continue to be open to immigration from all around the world. I believe we should. Americans believe we should. We know that men and women, even of humble circumstances, who come to the United States determined to make a life, to make a future, and to help their families have made a profound difference in our country in terms of its past and its future. And they come from every corner of the world. Senator Lindsey Graham was at that same meeting on January the 11th. He spoke up when the President uttered these infamous words which have been reported. And he noted that when it came to his family, they came from one of the countries which the President described, and they came with little or nothing to offer, but they wanted to be part of America. They came here and made a business, made a life, made a future, and brought to the Senate an extraordinary member representing the state of South Carolina. Many of us can tell the same story. My mother was an immigrant to this country. She was brought here in 1911 at the age of two from Lithuania. Lithuania was not exactly a prosperous nation in those times. It was under the thumb of the Russian Tsar, and it's one of the reasons my family left. One thing that my grandmother carried with her on that trip, I still have today. It was a Roman Catholic prayer book written in the Lithuanian language, which had been banned by the Russian government. She secreted this away in her luggage and brought it to the United States because she knew, and we know, that there is freedom of religion in this country. And no government was going to stop her from saying her prayers in her own language. 
That's my story. That's my family's story. That's America's story. What the President said in the White House last week did not recognize that fundamental truth that people just like my mother and my grandmother and just like Lindsey Graham's parents came to this country not because they were engineers, PhDs, wealthy people. They came here with the desire to build a life and to build a nation. And they have done it. When we hear all this talk about merit immigration, let's have merit selection of the people who are coming to these shores. Of course, there are certain experts we bring in with certain visas to fill needs in business and research. But by and large, we bring to this country people who are desperate to be part of our future. And we also bring people who want to be part of their family. You hear this phrase, linked migration, that somehow or another, if we bring one immigrant in, they're going to bring in a hundred. And some of them may not be desirable. What we find overwhelmingly is just the opposite is true. It's family unification. It's building the strength of a family. And isn't that fundamental to who we are as Americans? I know in my family and in many others, relatives who came in from other places really strengthened our family unit, gave us a chance to help one another and a chance to succeed. Now we face a critical moment, a critical moment on the issue of immigration. I listened to the Republican Senate leader come to the floor today, Senator McConnell, and when he speaks of DACA and the Dreamers, he uses the words illegal immigration. Technically, I suppose it is illegal. They are undocumented that we're talking about. But we have drawn a distinction over the years as to what happened to these young people and why they should be seen differently. They were brought here to the United States as infants and toddlers and children, at best teenagers, who had no voice in whether they were coming to this country. Did they break the law by overstaying a visa or crossing the border? Well, technically, of course they did. But should they be held culpable today? Should we deport these young people or give them a chance to be part of our future? This is not some idle philosophical discussion. This is a discussion made real by this administration, the Trump administration. It was September the 5th of last year when this president announced that he was going to repeal DACA. The program started by President Obama to protect these young people living in the United States. 780,000 of them have enrolled. And President Trump said as of March 5th of 2018, that program is ended. And then he turned and challenged the United States Congress, pass a law. If you don't like what I've done with this executive order, pass a law. So here we are over four months later. And the question has to be asked of the Republican leaders in the House and the Senate, what have you done to answer that president's challenge? And the answer, quite honestly, is precious little, if anything. The Republican leader comes to the floor today and says, there's no hurry. We can get to this later. It won't expire until March 5th. What he ignores is the obvious. 15,000 protected young people lost that protection during this period since September 5th. 122 a day are losing that protection. Fortunately, last week, a California court stepped in and said, stop taking away the protection of DACA from these young people. So we have a temporary stay being challenged by the Trump administration, which protects these young people for now. But that protection could end in a court decision tomorrow. That's the reality of life for young people. Yesterday in the Senate Judiciary Committee, we asked the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, do you believe the President can extend his March 5th deadline for the end of DACA? She said no. The President has said he doesn't have that authority. Well, I'll trust her statement and her judgment on that, but it further should put to rest this argument that's made by Senator McConnell that we have all the time in the world to deal with this issue. And let me tell you, as of March 5th, the deadline imposed by the President as of March 5th, horrible things will happen to innocent people. A thousand young people a day protected by DACA will lose their protection. I had one of them at the hearing yesterday. She is a young woman who has used her extraordinary skills to apply to medical school. And Loyola University, Stritch College of Medicine, accepted DACA protected young people for the first time. There are 28 of them in their ranks. 
She wants to be a doctor. She's helped people in underserved areas throughout her young career. But we know, everyone knows, that becoming a doctor means serving a residency, working those long hours to learn what it means to face clients or patients in a clinical setting. To become a resident, you need to be employed to take that job. If this young woman, who has devoted so many years of her life to her dream of being a doctor, loses the protection of DACA, she cannot apply for a residency. She's finished. There'll be no further progress in her medical education. That will happen starting on March 5th to 1,000 young people a day. So I would say to Senator McConnell, the Republican leader, there is a sense of urgency. We can't put this off. And the good news is that six United States senators, three of us on the Democratic side, three on the Republican side, have been doing what no other committee has done, no other senators have done. We've put together a bipartisan compromise that moves us forward on this DACA issue. It's something that uh, took four months, and they weren't an easy four months, they were difficult. We had to debate some of the hardest issues and come to an agreement. I ended up giving ground on some things which I wish I didn't have to. And I'm sure those on the Republican side feel the same way. But that's why we were sent here, weren't we? Democrats and Republicans to find a solution to the problems that face us. And this is a very real problem. So now the Republican leader comes to the floor and says, we don't have time to discuss this. We've got to get out of here uh, at the end of the week. Well, I disagree with him. We have enough time to do it. Take a look at this empty Senate floor and tell me we don't have enough time to take care of the DACA issue. Tell me that we don't have an opportunity to come to this floor and to bring the senators here and do what we were elected to do, to debate this issue, to vote on this issue, to solve a problem in America. This empty chamber is testimony to the fact that the Senate has done precious little for the last year and plans to do just about the same during the course of this year. I'm proud to be a member of the Senate, but I will tell you, I was prouder in the day when we actually debated measures on the floor. We ended up passing legislation to deal with America's challenges and problems instead of what we face today, an exchange of speeches in an empty chamber. So we have work to do. This morning I went over to the Department of Defense and met with Secretary Mattis. I respect him. He's our Secretary of Defense, was a four-star general in the Marine Corps. The man has served his, co his country with distinction. And he talked about what's going to happen to the budget of the Department of Defense if Congress doesn't act. And we told him, we want to get this job done. But we also said to Secretary Mattis, there are other elements of this government, there are other issues before us that need to also be brought forward. You heard Senator Schumer from New York, the Democratic Senate leader, come to the floor and turn to Senator McConnell and say, why is it always a take it or leave it when it comes to these measures? Why aren't we sitting down on a bipartisan basis to come up with a good way to move forward? Do you know, Mr. President, it's been 119 days into this fiscal year and we still don't have a budget for the United States of America? That's not just embarrassing, it's scandalous. To think that we have over a trillion dollars that needs to be debated and spent and we haven't been able to do it, and we're one-third through this fiscal year. The net result of that, of course, is to waste precious taxpayers' dollars and the energy of our elected officials who want to be applying that energy to solving problems rather than the problems that Congress creates. We can do this, and we can do it on a bipartisan basis. Senator Lindsey Graham and I, along with four of our colleagues, have a measure that we are going to present to the United States Senate. The purpose of that measure is to make it clear we are ready to debate. We are ready to move forward. We are ready to solve this problem that faces hundreds of thousands of young people across the United States of America. Some can call it illegal immigration, as Senator McConnell has. Others have called it amnesty, whatever they wish to call it. 80% of Americans believe we can solve this problem. As you walk around the Capitol here in the Capitol buildings, you will see young people who may step forward to introduce themselves. Many of them have never been to Washington before. I met one yesterday who had driven for 35 hours to come here. Why was she standing in the corridors of the Dirksen building here on Capitol Hill? 
She's a dreamer. She's protected by DACA. Her whole life is hanging in the balance as to whether this Congress will actually do something to solve a problem. She and others have come forward to challenge us. We should accept that challenge and we should meet it this week. We should say to President Obama, pardon me, to President Trump, we should say to President Trump, we have met the challenge which you put forth just six days ago, eight days ago, when on Tuesday of last week, you said to us, send me a bill and I will sign it. I'll take the political heat and don't take a lot of time to do it. We met that challenge with this bipartisan measure that we have proposed, and now we challenge others on the same issue. Come forward with your proposal. Come forward with your idea. And if you don't, at least give us a chance to present this bipartisan measure, which we have worked on long and hard to solve this critical issue. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the evidence of court. Clerk will call the roll.